We believe in a doctrine called dispensationalism. In other words, we believe in rightly dividing verses to the right group, uh, group of people in the right time period. Because if you don't do that, you're going to combine all the verses together and come up with major wrong doctrine. Now, I've received emails and questions from people online and in this church, and I want them to understand this. Okay, I am not accusing you guys of hyper-dispensationalism. What I'm saying is that a lot of people, because they get so much into dispensationalism, which is a great thing, amen? amen. amen. They want to learn more. They want to study more. Satan, he wants to take advantage of that. Yeah. So then he'll slip in wrong dispensationalism in there, and then you get carried too far into dispensationalism, you start to teach wrong doctrine. That's good. So here's... So here's one of the infamous wrong doctrines concerning dispensationalism is that the Christian church does not need water baptism. Now, here's something important to understand. We deny water baptism for salvation. Amen. We believe that was for the Jewish people. Yeah. Okay? That is a matter of fact if you look at all the verses in the Bible. This does not mean, however, that because it does not apply to our salvation, we throw out all the water out of the tub and we go dry cleaning together. That's not what we do. What you got to understand is that water baptism is a command yeah. by God for us to follow that is not required for salvation but for obedience. Yeah. Now, the hypers really don't like that. There are two things that they will scream their lungs about is water baptism and when did the body of Christ start. Those are two things they always fuss and fight about. If you go really hyper-dispensational like Bullinger, they will throw out the Lord's Supper too. They go that far, some of them. Why? Because it goes down to a trend. I kid you not, there are hyper-dispensationalists who teach that Jesus denied Peter nine times. They go that far in dividing, because those three denials seem to be different from the other three denials at the other book of the Bible, from the other three denials at the other book of the Bible. So Peter denied Jesus nine times. <laughs> they go that far. That's why you have to be careful of this dividing attitude. Did I say be careful of rightly dividing? No. I say dividing, you have to be careful. Yeah. There is such a thing called wrongly dividing. Amen. Why else did the Bible say rightly dividing? Amen. If God did not think there was such a thing called wrongly dividing. Okay, now let's talk about water baptism here. The most famous chapter, the most famous <coughs> books to say, uh, that we use to say that we do water baptism as a command out of obedience is Matthew 28. Verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now the other one is Mark chapter 16. But I want your hands to stay in Matthew 28 and Mark 16. Matthew 28 and Mark 16. We're going to compare both of these passages. These are famous passages that we use to preach the gospel everywhere. And that water baptism, we do this as following obedience. So we saw Matthew chapter 28, 19 through 20. And then Mark chapter 16, verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. And then you'll notice right here that this verse is used to preach the gospel to everywhere, right? It is used to preach the gospel everywhere. So based on Mark chapter 16, verse 15, and Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 through 20, we believe in preaching this gospel everywhere to all nations. Amen. So notice it did not say Jews, right? It said all nations. Notice in Mark 16, it says world, right? So this proves automatically that this baptism is for everybody. It's not just for Jews. Now, hyper-dispensationalists argue this way. They argue that if you look at Matthew 28 and you compare that with Matthew 24 and other verses at the book of Matthew, this gospel is actually referring to Jews. So the mid-acts, that's what hyper-dispensationalists are. They are mid acts groups. They're also called Grace Church. By the way, you're going to see this keyword Berean, Berean, quite a few times. 
Now, is there anything wrong with being a Berean? Absolutely not. Is there anything wrong with grace? Absolutely not. It's just that Satan starts to use those good terms, like Christian. Satan likes to use the term Christian and automatically fool you into thinking, I'm a good guy. Just because I use the word grace. Just because I use the word Berean. Just like how I use the word Christian when Catholics say they're Christian, Jehovah Witnesses say they're Christians, and everybody says they're a Christian. And so because you're a Christian, you must be okay. So these people, they're going to argue that this is for Jews because based off of Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Now, are they right? Yes. They're right. But this is their problem. Here's another key. You ready for this? This is their other problem. Not only do they get one aspect of the Bible wrong concerning transitions, which I covered in my previous teaching. Here's another key. You ready for this? This is how you catch hypers. Double application. Hmm. There is such a thing called double application, not just one application. Yeah. If you are a one application person, you will not understand the Bible and you will mess up. Yeah. You know what the greatest evidence is? I can give you scores and scores of verses, but I'm not going to do it for time's sake because I'm trying to prove baptism here. All you have to do is look at all the verses Paul used from the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Paul used them to apply to Christian church age doctrine. But when you look at the verses that he used, a lot of them were applied to Jewish doctrine and cannot apply to Christian church yeah. doctrine. Yeah. You know why? You can see double application there. Mm -hmm. Another easy example is not just Paul, all the verses he used from Old Testament. Look at all the messianic prophecies. Those are double application too. Because you're going to find verses where David talked himself about being persecuted. But what you're going to see is that he was speaking by the Holy Spirit, speaking about Jesus Christ. Amen. But if you look at the whole context, it's not about Jesus. Yeah. It was King David. See, there's a double application. If you don't believe me, then either one, you did not read your Bible enough. Because if you do read your Bible enough, you'll understand what I'm talking about. It makes a sense. You know I'm right about that. But then number two, another thing is this, is because you're probably not that much familiar. So start reading it. Start reading it and looking through that. And see if I'm wrong or not. Amen. Okay, but double application is a matter of fact. I can give you even a strong verse at the book of uh, Kings, I believe, at the book, no, no, at Samuel, where God was specifically talking about David's son Solomon, about his promise, but then he switched it to Jesus, but the context had nothing to do with Jesus. It had to do with Solomon. I can give that proof too, but I'm not going to do that. Okay, but anyway, so double application is a matter of fact. So, yes, there is no doubt that you have to believe there is something Jewish here. Now, those who are anti-dispensationalists, they're going to go, oh, no, it's not to the Jews. It's for us. It's for us. It's for us. You see how Satan always uses two extremes yeah. so that you can't find right doctrine? Amen. You've got to be careful. The anti-dispensationalists are wrong because look at verse 16, okay? You believe in that, baptism for salvation? Come on. Not only that, verse 17 and 18, that's where charismatic Pentecostals come in. Some Baptists who are anti-dispensationalists, they don't believe in that. So see right here? Obviously, we know that these things are applying to what? The apostolic era, the acts of the apostles who are ministering to Jews. So there's no doubt there's Jewish application. And that's very plain in Matthew 24. You can't deny that in other passages in Matthew where Jesus said that this gospel is going to be preached to all nations. And he was specifically referring to Jews in the tribulation. He even said the word tribulation there. Yeah. What are you going to do about that? Yeah. What are you going to do about that? So you see right here that um, there is no doubt that there is a Jewish application, but it's a double application. Okay, so I'm not going to prove Jews, okay? We know one Jews. We'll just take that for granted, okay? Because I'm addressing hypers here, not anti-dispensationalists. But now we've got to prove that this is for the Christian church. So this said world, all nations. So I'm trying to prove that this is referring to as well as to us today, the Gentiles. So how do we know this applies to us as well, the, re the remaining people? Okay, so let's see how the disciples thought about that. This is important. 
anyone can interpret this passage and take it either way. They might say, well, it, may, it doesn't apply to me or it doesn't apply to me. Let's see what the disciples thought about this command, how it applied. Ready? Okay, let's go to the book of Acts chapter 10 first. Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. This was only for Jews, only for Jews. Really, only for Jews. Hmm. Let's see what the Bible says. Acts chapter 10 and verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in what? Every nation. Every nation. Okay, maybe, I didn't say he is, maybe, just maybe, Peter thought when Jesus said all nations, that that's what he meant at verse 35. But let's just assume for now, okay? This assumption is going to be solidified even more. Let's just keep reading. Every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto who? See, Israel. Okay, there's no doubt about that. This was Jews preaching peace by Jesus Christ. That word I say ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God did anoint Jesus, Christ, Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost. And we're going to look at verse 39. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. Right, because it went to the Jews. Now, look at uh, verse uh, 42. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of, of quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Remember, Peter said this. Did you pay attention? Peter said, Jesus commanded us to preach this gospel to every nation. But he meant, you notice right here, he prioritized Jerusalem, right? You know why it was going from Jerusalem? Because it was primarily Jewish. But see, they don't think. What, what, do you know what I'm about to say again? Remember, what, what is the hyper-dispensationalist problem again? Transition. It was going from Jew to Gentile. So yes, if you look at Matthew 28, Mark 16, there are Jewish elements. Why? Because they had to start with Jews. But there is no doubt there are things that had to apply to Gentile because it was transitioning and Peter took this command to go to Gentiles. Keep your hand in Acts 10. I'm going to show you at Acts 10 later on. Go back to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. We're going to go back to Acts 10, but keep go back to Acts 1. We're going to look at verse 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. See, they're going to be his witness. Remember what Peter said at Acts 10? He was saying, I'm being a witness to you. I'm supposed to be a witness. And I'm preaching to you and about the gospel. Unto me both in where? Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto where? The uttermost part of the earth. It was going from Jew... To Gentile. Now go back to Acts 10. If you don't believe me. What happened after this? While Pete, in verse 44. While Peter yet spake these words. The Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision. See Jews. Which believed were astonished. As many as came with Peter. Because that on the who? Gentiles. They received this. Okay so. Peter took the command from Jesus as to address to Gentiles too, not to Jews. That doesn't include water baptism. Oh, really? Really? Look at verse 47. Can any man forbid what? Water that ye should not be what? Bapt this is water baptism. Which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we. Well, it's just an option, not a command. No, look at verse 48. And he what? commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. It's a command, folks. Water baptism is a command from God. You've got to get that in your head. Peter took it that way. I don't think Paul did. It doesn't matter if Paul didn't think so. This is scripture, word of God. Peter wrote right there. But um, uh, let's look at our beloved apostle Paul, shall we, as the phrase goes. 
Look at the book of uh, Romans, chapter 1. Romans, chapter 1. What did Paul think about the gospel here? Look at Romans, chapter 1. Verse 16. Verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Remember the Bible says preach the gospel to every creature. All right? And then uh, Jesus said to all nations. Acts chapter 1. Jesus said it will be preached from Jerusalem to all the world. Peter took it that way. Now look what Paul thinks about it. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew what? First and also to the what? Ah, transition. ding a ling a ling a ling a ling Got it? Makes sense. That's why there is no doubt that in Mark 16 and Matthew 28, you can't apply everything to the Christian church. There has to be references referring to Jews in the tribulation. But here's another thing. You can't just solely apply everything. To, you can't put everything either on Jews either in the tribulation or during the Jewish dispensation. You have to put it to these Gentiles too. Wow, how about that? By the way, why would Paul do Acts 16? Look at Acts 16. Our beloved Apostle Paul, our beloved Apostle Paul, if Paul is your beloved Apostle to follow, why don't you do what he did in Acts 16? Acts chapter 16. What did he take this as? Notice in Acts chapter 16 and verse 30. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said... Repent, confess, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive... No! That's Church of Christ talk. And they said what? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Nothing to do with water baptism, just believing on Christ. And then while the Church of Christ is refuted, here comes another group of heretics called hyper dispensation. See, no baptism, no baptism, no baptism. Look at verse 32. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was what? Baptized. Baptized. But look, when? He and all his when? Straightway, immediately. Uh, isn't this something, baptism, that I should think between me and God? No, 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 Paul. They didn't think it that way. Now. Immediately. Hmm. By the way, read all the verses from the book of Acts about the Apostle Paul's ministry. Did you ever notice whenever he led people to salvation, when they believed, it also mentioned he baptized them? If, if you're going to be a follower of the Apostle Paul, why don't you follow him? See, you're just picking and choosing what you like from the Apostle Paul in reality. You're not really a Pauline Christian. You're just picking and choosing which Pauline reference that you want to yourself Rather than taking it as a command. Taking everything. You've got to take everything of what the whole counsel of God, what it shows you. Not picking and choosing which suits your preference level. Okay, but anyways, let's uh, look at 1 Peter. 1 Peter. Now, the hyper-dispensationalist favorite reference, I'm just going to briefly say this because uh, I feel like it's important. Their favorite reference is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where Paul did not baptize people. That's their favorite reference. So I'm going to mention that real briefly about 1 Corinthians 1. So they claim Paul did not believe in water baptism based off of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'll read it to you quickly. In verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words. Lest the God, cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Uh, verse 14. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. Lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. So notice right here from verse 14 through 17. It seems to show that Paul disapproved of baptism. No, that's not what it's showing here. What it's showing you here from verse 14 through 17 is that he's trying to show you here baptism is not the gospel of salvation. Look at verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, separated but to what? 
preach the gospel. See, he's separating the gospel from baptism. He's saying that baptism is not a part of the gospel. That's why he's thanking God at verse 14 and 16 that he didn't baptize all these people. Because people like Church of Christ, for example, and majority of religions and heretics, they claim baptism is required for salvation. And Paul's trying to show right here, nope, I thank God I didn't baptize these people. I was preaching them the gospel, and they got saved by the gospel. Then what were they saved by if they didn't get baptized right here then? See, that's what he was trying to get his point across. By the way, this doesn't prove that Paul denounced baptism because look at verse 16. He baptized somebody there. <laughs> look at that. See, hypers like to nitpick. They like to pick and choose. That's their problem. Another favorite passage is, uh, this is, this is their favorite. You ready? Let's go to Ephesians 4. This is their favorite. They will quote this. Ephesians 4. There's only one baptism, only one baptism, only one baptism. So look at Ephesians chapter 4. And then we'll read verse 5. There's only one baptism, and it's not water baptism. It's the Holy Spirit baptism when you believe on Christ. So that's their resorting argument to prove that we Christians don't follow water baptism. Verse 5. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. See, that's their reference. That's their point. But here's their problem. Their problem is, is that if you look at verse 3, what's the context of this? Endeavoring to keep the unity of the what? Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, spiritual. One spirit, spiritual. Even one hope of your calling, spiritual. One Lord, spiritual. One faith, spiritual. One baptism, spiritual. One God and Father of all, who is above all through all. Spiritual. The context is spiritually. Obviously, there is only one spirit that is right, that we follow. All other spirits are wrong. And, that, and that's why the Bible says God is a spirit, not just spirit. We're not this new age stuff where, oh, any spirit is fine. No, just one spirit. That is the Holy Ghost. That is God. That's why for us it's one spiritual. So it's by one spiritual context here. Obviously he's not going to include water baptism here. Water baptism is not a spiritual thing. It is a physical thing that you can feel and touch and you get wet. That is not the Holy Spirit you're touching and feeling like some church of Christ would like you to think. That the blood of Jesus and the Spirit of God is in that water that you touch. If that's the case, then you should honor it and kiss it and don't throw, it, throw out the bath water on, onto the ground after you get baptized. So you see right here, this is referring to a spiritual context. Of course, there is only one spiritual baptism. There is only one spiritual baptism. That's the Holy Ghost baptism. Water baptism is not, has nothing to do with your spiritual context, your spiritual salvation. It has nothing to do. All it does, it makes you wet. That's all it does. Now, 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Here's something that boggles my mind. Are you telling me throughout the dispensations ever since the, ever since the timeline of the apostles and Paul, through the early churches, all the way through the Dark Ages, through all the uh, Baptists and many Christians during the Great Awakening revivals, up till today, all of a sudden the hyper-dispensationalists got right during the 1900s somewhere, or maybe 1800s if I'm going to give them that early, that all of a sudden that we, we're not doing water baptism. You're all wrong. We all got it right. Doesn't make sense. Okay, 1 Peter chapter 3. That's why Peter said this. He took this as a command. Look at verse 21. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. <gasps> baptism for salvation. That's what the church of Christ will argue. Uh-uh. Look at the parentheses. Not the putting away of the filth of the what? Flesh. It has nothing to do to save you from the sins of your flesh. Now, people who don't believe me, all you have to do, I'll read it quickly. You don't have to turn here. If you don't think this has to do with your sin, all you have to do is read 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. It says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves 
from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. See that? This has to do with your sins. So notice that this verse, which supposedly pr proves baptism for salvation, is actually attacking baptism for salvation. It's saying baptism has nothing to do with your forgiveness of sins, washing away your sins. Then what is this saving you from? But the answer of a what? Good, Good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Peter knew. Why? Because he took, uh, back in Acts 10, he commanded them. He knew that this was something that they had to follow. Now, a lot of people, what they would like to argue is that, uh, well, you know, this is what... <laughs> so, I'm just... Uh, hypers, they will always use this tactic. If they find a Jew anywhere, I mean, you can find a Jew three chapters later or just one time it mentions a Jew, then they'll automatically chop off the whole book and say that is only for Jews. Look, if you're going to do that, you might as well chop off the Apostle Paul at the book of Romans because he said, I'm a Jew. What are you going to do about that one? I thought that he was our beloved Apostle Paul. So you got to understand this. is that that's just a, that's, uh, That is not studying the scriptures. That's actually, okay, I don't want to be offensive, but I want people to understand this. That's actually honestly being intellectually dishonest and lazy. Anyone can find a Jew anywhere in a verse and then divide it off. That is, <laughs> you're, then you know what you're going to get? You're going to come across major problems. Okay, so what they would like to do is that claim that Peter was a book written to Jews only and that it was for the timeline of the tribulation. It's true, you'll see Jewish references there. It's true, you'll see tribulation references over there. But then, again, what is this? What is this church? Double application. Now, look, if you want to say this is not the Christian church, look at verse 4. What did Peter say? To an inheritance, incorrupted and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through what? Faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. You see that? Say by faith, eternally secured at verse 4, not only that, look at verse 3. There's your gospel by the resurrection of the dead. There's your Christian gospel. You're going to say that's only for Jews in the tribulation? By the way, look at verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout what? Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. See, what are you going to do about that? Those are Gentiles there. Those are Gentiles. Those aren't Jews. What are you going to do about that one? can't do anything about that. By the way, what are you going to do with verse 23? Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. See that? Born again. What are you going to do over and over again uh, with all these verses that shows a lot of Christian doctrine right here? And it shows a lot of, uh, it shows a lot of Christian doctrine. It shows a lot of references that does not have to be solely to the Jewish people. Okay, but anyways, uh, I'm going to close it off right here. I, want, uh, I can't continue on and on, but I'm just going to stop it right here. So this is an important thing. If you don't have this, you're going to mess up. I remember that uh, there were a few, a few members that mentioned to me about you know, this interesting thing about dispensationalism and about different things about being born again and stuff like that. And I was like, it kind of sounds hyper to me. But the members didn't know about that. So then when I looked at the channel, I was like, I only needed uh, five minutes. <laughs> I was like, yep, hyper. You might say, how do you know that? All you have to do is this. All you have to do is look up at the person, Google that person's name and his ministry, look at their doctrinal statement. You'll find mid-acts, grace, body of Christ did not start until the book. Uh, yep, okay, hyper right there. That's hyper. So it's very easy to spot a hyper dispensationalist. They will always, they love so much talking about the body of Christ did not start until somewhere in the middle of Acts, somewhere like that. If you hear that, and not only that, you hear these strange references where they keep going, Jew, 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 our beloved apostle Paul. That's their key, that's their catchphrase. Our beloved apostle Paul. 
Like, he's their beloved. Like, why would you say that, okay? I know the Apostle Paul is, uh, is our Apostle. He's the Apostle to the Gentiles. But why do you have to put our beloved Apostle Paul? And you say that, repeat that over and over and over again. Strange spirit. That's a strange spirit right there. Paul didn't even want that. He wanted you to set your eyes on Jesus Christ, not on him. Amen. 